Thank you, Akash. Uh, so, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the third webinar, third and final webinar, and uh, happy International Women's Day. Say it back in the chat if you can. <laughs> so I am the host for tonight's webinar. My name is Swan, and I am the one of the founders of Control D Studio based in Malaysia. Um, so a little bit of background, we started one of the first games we ever uh, published was Ano Journeys Through Tattoos, a tattoo game inspired by the traditional hand tap tattooing of one of the Sarawakian um, indigenous communities here. Um, but that's I've done talks about that already. That, so enough about me for tonight. Tonight, I am joined by two very distinguished gentlemen, uh, both of whom have a multitude of experience working in serious games from academic and research um, to tech sector to philanthropy and US federal government. So um, I will let them introduce themselves. Perhaps let's start with Paul. Thanks, Swan. Um, and it, it's so awesome to be with you and to see so many cool people in the chat. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you all today and answering your questions. And then, yeah, when, when we get to the game jam, uh, seeing what comes out of this. Um, as Akash and Swan mentioned, I'm Paul Fisher. I'm at the Global Engagement Center at the US Department of State. I, I'm a senior technology officer and a contractor, and I lead on our use of video games to promote media literacy and train players to pre-bunk disinformation. So I'll get into pre-bunking a little bit later, I'm sure, but uh, for now, I'll hand it back over to Swan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Dale, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Swan. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is Dale Linegar, so I'm the director of uh, Games for Change Asia Pacific. Um, that's how I've sort of worked with Suan over the past few years as well. Um, yeah, happy International Women's Day to everybody as well. Um, it's a big day for me. I have three daughters, so it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, the pleasure of my role with Games for Change Asia Pacific is getting to see lots of different the ways that games are being used throughout different communities to solve different problems. Um, and then in my other day job, I work on mixed reality training systems. So we do aeromedical training at the moment for the Air Force here in Australia. So that's sort of how you treat people while they're on a plane. Uh, and I'm also doing a PhD, so I'm a little bit of a researcher as well, but I'm not good at that yet. Um, so it's really nice to meet you all. Look forward to having a good chat. All right. Thank you, Dale. Um, OK, so just to kind of go through like the rough points of what we're going to what we'll be talking about tonight. So tonight's discussion will revolve around creating games with a social purpose and how people in the games industry can use their skills, knowledge, and passion to create interactive experiences that drive positive change within our society. Um, in this session, we'll highlight the different ways in which global initiatives and industry professionals are addressing issues of societal importance through games. So even if you're, you aren't from the games industry and you're here with us tonight. Um, I hope by the end of this session, you will have an idea on how you or your community or your organizations can leverage on the advantages of telling your stories through games. So what better way to start a conversation about creating games than to talk about examples of games that have been successful in addressing these real world problems that we talk about and what made them effective in doing so. Um, and let's start with Paul. So with your team at the US Department of State's Global Engagement Center, um, perhaps that's also something you might want to explain, yeah. Global Engagement Center. Um, so you produce two interesting games tackling disinformation titled Harmony Cat, uh, um, I've completely been, <laughs> Harmony Square and Cat Park. Um, could you briefly share with us what these games are about and how they effectively deliver the intended lesson or message? Sure. Thanks, Swan. Uh, yeah, so the Global Engagement Center leads on behalf of the U.S. government to coordinate efforts to counter foreign propaganda and disinformation. Uh, and so then within that framework, I'm on the technology team. And so the at the technology team, we assess, test, and scale different private sector capabilities to either understand or in some way counter that foreign propaganda or disinformation threat. So it's pretty serious stuff. <laughs> and maybe, I guess that was now four years ago, 
our leadership made the choice to invest in video games. They sort of identified video games as an opportunity to reach people where they are and to train players to do that pre-bunking that I described. So pre-bunking might be a new word for some of you. Maybe you've heard of debunking. So debunking, that's reactive. After something has already you know, entered the media landscape, people are talking about it. You know, you've all probably heard whatever crazy rumor uh, you know, either about the government or about a local celebrity, whatever it is, you've probably heard something. And then, you know, maybe a week later, maybe, maybe a day later, maybe a week later, maybe a month later, the truth comes out. All right. So that's debunking. It's reactive. And it's after that narrative has already, you know, taken hold. Uh, so what we want to do is train players to do that pre-bunking. So empowering each individual consumer of media to sort of take that breath, to pause when they see something online and ask themselves, well, is this real? Is this the truth? Am I being manipulated? Starting to ask sort of these reflective, critical thinking questions. So in 2019, uh, in partnership with a Dutch video game studio called Tilt and then University of Cambridge, uh, we put out our first video game called Harmony Square. So Harmony Square, uh, the sort of recurring joke in Harmony Square is whether or not you put pineapple on pizza. So it's, you know, totally ridiculous. I, I like pineapple on pizza, but I, that might be like a controversial take for some people. But the point is that we didn't create a game about like a very specific narrative or story that you're hearing. We wanted to create something that's not going to make people mad unless you're like, fanatical about pineapple and pizza. Uh, we wanted to create something that would be fun and enjoyable and that could last forever, right? It's not going to get old as the news story that the game is about expires. So in that game, you learn, you play the bad guy, you play the chief disinformation officer, and you sort of learn the tactics and techniques used to spread disinformation on social media. So clickbait headlines, sensational language, trolling, and ultimately escalation to violence. Uh, so that game came out in late 2020. It's currently in 18 languages with number 19 coming any day now. Um, and it's been played over 400,000 times in every country in the world. So that was a huge success for us. And not just that it's out there and it's being played, and there's a media literacy lesson plan for the game too. But University of Cambridge has told us that the game works. So we know uh, from our social scientists at Cambridge that each individual player who plays that game is then statistically better at making that discernment between reliable and unreliable information. And then critically, those players are then less likely to share myths or disinformation on social media. Oh, Steph, thanks for dropping the links. And so that led us to our second game, Cat Park, which came out at the end of last year. You heard that right? Yeah, the State Department did pay to create a game about cats and disinformation. Uh, and that game builds on the work of Harmony Square in some critical ways. So again, you're playing the bad guy. You're learning about the tactics and techniques used to spread disinformation, so memes, manipulated media and those clickbait headlines again. But the, I think the mechanics are more fun in that game. Uh, so like you're, you're crafting the meme to like, you know, spe uh, spread your, your disinformation about, it's ridiculous that the city is spending money on cats and a park for cats, outrageous. Uh, so that the mechanics have gotten a lot better in that game. And then the effects, because again, we worked with those social scientists at Cambridge, uh, they told us that the game is even more effective than our first at training players to make that discernment between reliable and unreliable information, and then are even less likely to share disinformation on social media after playing the game. So we're pretty excited about these two games and we keep rolling out more languages. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a full-time job, you know, uh, balancing the embassies like uh, Akash and Kuala Lumpur, and then our other embassies around the world who are using the game, the developers in the Netherlands, and then those researchers in the UK, and then I'm in Washington. So it's, uh, it's a full-time job.
All right, thank you, Paul. I uh, can't wait till you start expanding it on more ridiculous topics that people can fight about. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so Dale, um, coming to Dale. So games will change Asia Pacific, uh, G4C APAC for short, guys. If you hear me say G4C, it means games will change, uh, was established in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and in three short years, has been able to attract a variety of people from across the region interested in and working on their own serious games as well. Um, what are some of the interesting games that the festival has highlighted thus far? Sure. Um, I guess my answer is a little bit different in the fact that um, in our time, um, both personally, I've been developing games for sort of the past 17 years now and always serious games, never just normal games. And then through the involvement with Games for Change Asia Pacific, I think I've seen almost every topic you can imagine um, approached somehow. Um, what I'd love to do is ask, is anybody have a topic of interest? Because then I can focus on that. Um, some of the more interesting ones that I've seen lately and the ones that I always talk about are things like there's a game called Sound Scouts that's used for diagnosing hearing problems in young people here in Australia. Uh, there's also another game called Tali Health, which is used for the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD. Uh, in young people. So this is where I think it's probably the most exciting area for me, where games are turning into sort of medical diagnostic and medical treatment devices. Um, and that's really exciting to see that you can sort of treat some of these disorders without drugs or other sorts of treatments that would have been used in the past. Um, and then there's, there's, there's just such a broad spectrum of people using games to solve problems like I know another one was you know a game that just illustrated some of the issues with domestic violence which was then expanded to Malaysia as well um, and the, the inspiring story for me with that was that it was a a very very talented woman who'd attended a Gays for Change conference in New York um, really felt that she should be changing the world and she quit her job in finance and went off and developed this game for domestic violence that highlights and sort of talks about domestic violence a little bit. So some of the trickier topics that are being handled by games, I think are very clever. And I think Malaysia is very good at that as well. Um, the work that you're doing, Suan, the work that Sakina is doing as well. Um, and Sakina's game, you know, using metaphor and monsters to tackle different societal problems. I think there's some very clever stuff happening out there and we've just all got a lot to learn from each other. And I believe the um, the game surrounding domestic violence that you mentioned, uh, she was also working with Sakina, isn't it? Uh, yes. On that I'm game. Yeah. And and I I do remember they were also featured um, during the first Games for Change Asia Pacific uh, festival as well. They had a segment. Yeah, it's really hard to highlight any that are like the beauty of doing Games for Change is that everybody brings their own issues. Everybody has something they're really, really passionate about. And I get to sit back and go, okay, this is not necessarily my thing, or this is not what I think is important in the world, but it is what this person thinks is important. For example, another example is Nico and Chaos Theory Games out of Sydney. Like everything they do is about the environment. Um, and I'm not saying I don't care about the environment, but I'm nowhere near as passionate as they are. And I'm really grateful that we have people that are so passionate. And I think they've just released another game recently. I'll have to look up what it is. But they've done games about the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef and, you know, really big issues that are happening under our nose. Um, and they're speaking to kids in a language that they understand uh, and getting their message across in a really palatable way rather than sort of bashing people over the head saying, stop, stop hurting the environment. So. Mm. Swan, can I jump in here and just reply to Dale? Perfect. Okay, Dale, and like that, it's such important work that all these devs are doing to create really powerful games for storytelling. And like when I heard a dev, his name's Osama Darius. He he had this great line that I'll never forget. He said, "You know, games are just another means for storytelling." And each individual dev has to think about like, what is the story that they're passionate about and that only they can tell. So like those devs who are telling stories about the importance of protecting the environment 
or Swan's game that talks about you know, tattoos and cultural heritage preservation. Like, it's so cool to see how people are using the medium of games to tell really important stories. I just love it. Like, it's it's such a, a fun break for me when I get to I get to play somebody else's game for work. Uh, it's it's a blast. Yeah, and I think that's the mediums evolved, especially like sort of. 15, eight, well, it's about 18 years ago now, I was a games lecturer at a university and 90% of the kids that I was teaching were just there to make shooting games. Yeah. And it was kind of horrible. It was like, you know, teaching, you wouldn't expect to teach a film, film students, you wouldn't want them all to make action films. You know, you'd really hope that there's a bit more variety in the mix. Um, and most films that you see these days, they do have a moral, they do have a message, they do have that deep story behind them. Um, even the action movies will tend to have something more to them. Like there's very few films that are just action. Um, games are still behind film and other forms of media and books, especially in that regard. Like a lot of the kids that get into making games are still just thinking of the games that they know, which is, you know, the Call of Duties and things like that. And that's what games are to them. Um, but yeah, like you said, Paul, I think games can be and should be so much more than that. You know, they should really be about doing what's important to us and expressing things that are important to us which is hopefully more than just a competitive shoot em up and they're fun too like they're getting yeah yeah <laughs> uh in my previous role we organized a game jam that was specific to cultural heritage preservation and protection this is why uh swan and i bonded so tightly over her her um tattoo game uh so you know, in, my, in a different office at the State Department that works on cultural heritage preservation and protection all over the world, we thought sort of like, okay, how do we how do we reach people where they are? How do we reach young people to engage in this topic instead of sort of our normal audience of like museum managers or law enforcement or you know people who are tasked with protecting museums or archaeological sites? And so we did a game jam. And we had like 900 people from 72 countries create 116 games that were really beautiful, celebrating cultural diversity, raising awareness about those threats to heritage, educating about how climate is impacting heritage. And our, our winning game from the Game Jam, the devs were from Peru, Sweden, and Iran, and they'd created a game about Peruvian cultural heritage and how climate change is making archaeological sites in Peru easier to loot. And then the, the culture, um, it's Chachapoya culture, which is like a, um, you know, it's another indigenous group in Peru. Like there's a museum of Chachapoya people in Peru, and now they've adopted the game in the museum as like a way of talking about, you know, this, this culture and the importance of protecting and preserving it. That is awesome to hear. Um, that kind of reminds me of, um, we, so in my city, we don't really have a games, like a, a big existing games industry. Um, so myself and a few others, we took it upon ourselves and like, you know what, let's create like our the state's own like game development um, community, you know, because that's what we wanted, a community. Um, and then we had our very first game jam. So our state being kind of quite popular, uh, for uh, showing off culture because we have a lot of indigenous groups here as well. Um, if I'm not wrong, we have something like 100 plus or 200, if I'm not wrong, uh, indigenous groups. And so we wanted to make our first game jam topic uh, cultural. And I think what was great from that also was we had people who did not have any sort of game development experience. Um, they just joined and they were like, I'm interested and I would like to try. So we had one team, um, three of them. Two of them, I think, were mathematicians. Uh, and one of them was from engineering. And they came out with a Chinese pixel horror game um, depicting one of the quite unknown um, Chinese demons. So... When they came up with that, it, you know, it just really showed like, wow, this is this is amazing. This is what games can do, and this is what games can push people to do, and um, the kind of stories that we can tell. And okay, so moving on, uh, now that we've all gone through some 
super cool examples um, what games have been done in the scene. Um, maybe now let's dive into what kind of real world impacts um, have been observed or analyzed as a result of these games. And how do we go about measuring these results to know that they were effective? Um, you know, like I think kind of going back to Paul. Um, so you mentioned that the universities did tell you guys that, okay, these, um, these games were actually uh, effective in doing what they were supposed to do. Um, so in Harmony Square, when I played it, uh, I did notice that there were two surveys one right before the game and one immediately after. I have to admit, I didn't do the one right after. <laughs> um, but how did that actually aid you or and the universities in measuring the efficacy of the game? Uh, and was that same method used for Cat Park? Yeah, it, it was uh, that same, it, the exact same methodology was used for Cat Park. Um, so yeah, the, the survey is currently live in Harmony Square we're tweaking it now to, before we make it live in Cat Park. But um, when you launch Harmony Square, you're presented with an optional survey. So it, it's, it's optional, right? You do not have to take the survey. You can just jump straight to the fun part and play the game. But if you take the survey, and then I hope you will also take the post survey because that's how we measure the impact. Um, so in the, the pre and post surveys, which are identical, you're presented with eight tweets. Uh, and you're asked to rate the reliability of each tweet on a scale of one to seven. Seven, you find this tweet totally reliable, or one, this, this tweet is bogus, this is, it's not true, this is uh, very unreliable. Okay, so then those tweets, there are four tweets in there that are, you know, pretty factual, like, you know, something about President Biden, or, you know, something about NASA, or something about, um, like cars. So information that is presented factually. The other four tweets are meant to sort of get you to think about those tactics and techniques that the game is spotlighting. So there's one about conspiracy theories. Uh, that's the one that's like, maybe the, the, you know, civilization has restarted and the world is actually, you know, much older than it is or something. Um, there's another tweet that exemplifies trolling. There's another one that exemplifies sensational language. And so when you take the survey before playing the game, maybe you don't pick up on those things. Maybe you don't notice the trolling. Maybe you don't notice the conspiracy theory. Maybe you don't notice the, um, let's see, conspiracy theory, da, 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 trolling or sensational language. After playing the game, the way that we measure the impact is that you find those tweets that are exemplifying that bad behavior less reliable. And that's how we measure the change. That's how Cambridge has measured the change. And so we continue to collect that survey data. Um, on my end at the State Department, that data is entirely anonymous. Um, you know, the, the European uh, studio, Tilt, that created the game, you know, they are compliant with European privacy laws and they take that very seriously. So I'm not, you know, I'm not getting any data about people who take the survey. Um, but what the surveys are telling us is that the game continues to work. It continues to train people to make that discernment between reliable and unreliable information. And that the, those people who play the game are less likely to share unreliable information on social media after playing the game. So it's really cool. Um, I can go into more detail about those surveys. Um, that's how we, we measured the impact of both games, Harmony Square and Cat Park. Um, and I mean, just candidly, you know, this sort of, it, it raises a lot of really important questions. So there are the privacy concerns that I talked about. Um, you know, secondly, some of those tweets are very Western centric. And so we're trying to think about now updating those tweets because the games are in 18 languages trying to make sure that somebody without sort of the, the cultural knowledge or the you know, sort of insider view of um, politics in the United States or wherever will still understand the tweets and be able to make that discernment between reliable and unreliable information. So that's a really important piece that we're working on. Uh, and then thirdly, a really interesting impact of the game is we were finding that in some cases, people who played the game 
then we're just skeptical of everything that they read online. Like they didn't believe anything after playing the game, which is not what we want. We want people to be able to make that discernment between, okay, is this true? Or is somebody trying to manipulate me with those, those tactics and techniques, memes, manipulated media, trolling, clickbait headlines. We want people to be able to be on the lookout for those, those tactics. Uh, and so we're implementing now a new feature inside of Harmony Square before the game ends, before you would get to that post survey, where we're reinforcing the learning and training players. Again, there is reliable information out there. And then in the game, you there's like a, a points mechanic and you get rewarded for correctly identifying reliable or unreliable information. So yeah, it's it's an evolving process as we continue to sort of like figure out what is the best way to really um, have the best impact for, for learning, for media literacy. And I think your work like in the Global Engagement Center, um, you work with like so many people. I think that also helps uh, you kind of put a lot of focus on localization and how important that is. Oh, sure. Yeah, I could talk about localization all day because um, it is really important, not just in the tweets, but in the whole game. So uh, this is a real, I think, strength and advantage and improvement that Cat Park has over Harmony Square. In Harmony Square, it's more difficult to localize. I mean, so we can translate the game and then we can make sure that the jokes in the game are going to make sense in the context. So, you know, for instance, in the English language version of Harmony Square, there's a joke about uh, what we would call TPing somebody's house, which is when you take toilet paper and you throw it over and like you cover somebody's entire house like a mummy <laughs> and you dress it up uh, with toilet paper. Uh, that's like a, a prank that I did and was, you know, a victim of when I was a kid. It's just like a weird thing that we do here in America. I don't know why, but like that joke is not going to make sense basically anywhere else. <laughs> so we can't have that same joke in any of the game's other 17 languages in French and Russian in Latvian in Ukrainian. The, the joke is just not going to make sense. So we give the translators a lot of leeway when doing that. But in Cat Park, there's even more room for localization. So not just translating and changing the jokes, but we can change those memes so that they will make sense in the local context. You know, everybody has their own memes that make sense. Like um, somebody was telling me like, you know, if you go to the doctor in the Netherlands or whatever, no matter what your problem is, they're going to tell you to take to uh, ibuprofen and come back in a week, right? So like if, if everybody knows that like, you know, the doctor is just gonna tell you to take two ibuprofen and then sleep it off, okay, then that can make sense in a joke, like in a meme that will make sense in that context. So that's a meme that we could use in the game if that made sense. Um, but also we can change then the physical appearance and dress of the characters in the game. So this is something that I'm really excited about is you know the characters as they're drawn and rendered now in Cat Park, I mean, we tried broadly to capture like the diversity of the world in these characters, but you know, there were only five characters in the game. So like you can't capture every place there. I mean, it's just impossible. So what we're thinking about is as we add new languages to the game, we can make the characters look and feel and dress like players in the country or region that speak that language. So that's a really exciting feature that I, I haven't gotten to roll out yet, but I'm hoping to later this year. Excited to see it. <laughs> oh. <Thank> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so still on the topic of like effectiveness of um, games or social impact. Um, so the ways in which we measure the effectiveness vary a lot from project to project. Um, and coming back to Dale, uh, so you spend quite a lot of time working with XR technology and simulation games, um, which a lot of institutions and companies uh, are actually interested in because it's almost as if they're always um, promoted as like you promoted with their ability to kind of see and measure these results in real time as the player is immersed. Um, 
so myself being kind of in that space as well, like I can see why um, the bigger institutions are going for it. Um, so maybe you could share some of these methods of measurement um, that you have seen or worked with in your projects uh, and the impacts that you've seen as well from uh, some of the games in this area. Sure. Um, and I'll probably be a little bit negative here uh, because it's really, really difficult with a lot of games. So like the, the method that Paul described is one of the obvious ones, the Supreme Post. There's control groups, so you have one control group do it the traditional way, one do it the new way with your game, who remembers the facts the most or who learned more effectively. Um, but then as, as Paul mentioned, as Paul got into, th there's a real issue with the fact that as a game creator, you create games that embody your own values um, and you can't help but do that. So we've had an example, just like Paul was saying, where we made an accounting ethics game here in Melbourne, which is a lot less boring than it sounds. You can end up in jail if you make the wrong decisions and the game mechanics are quite interesting. But the interesting thing we had with that when we rolled it out was it's really about standing up to your boss and saying, no, that's the wrong thing. And we had a lot of our Chinese background students, which is quite a large percentage of the students here doing MBAs at universities here in Melbourne, coming up to us after it saying, we wouldn't do that culturally that's not okay we're not going to stand up to our boss when we're a junior accountant in a new firm um whereas for us australians of course we would um we're loud we're brash we're probably quite close to americans in that way but yeah if somebody does something wrong we'll say it straight away um so that cultural difference was really important so it's hard then to you can't really judge somebody from another culture as you judge someone who's coming from the same culture as the creator um, so that's one of the difficulties we face. Um, another one of the difficulties, which is a really big one when you're tackling these big sort of wicked problems, and I talked about chaos theory in their environmental games before. So they're making really amazing games that are targeting young kids to, to teach them about the Great Barrier Reef uh, and how it's getting bleached and you know the environmental impacts of some of the activities that we're doing. But they're targeting kids who realistically don't have much agency at the moment they can't make decisions they're not the ones who are deciding to recycle or use less energy or do all these sorts of things so really and all also it's part of a multitude of things that these kids are getting taught about in the environment so how do you then measure the impact that one little app has had on their behavior long term you know can you come back in because i can think of films that i saw when i was a kid and the example i always bring up is there's a fantastic film called The Power of One, which is about racism in South Africa. And that just hit me so deep as a young child. Um, and I think about it now, 25, 30, 40 years later. Um, how do you measure that impact? How do you measure how long something stays and how deep it is and whether it's affecting them consciously or subconsciously or yeah, whatever it may be? Um, and to answer your actual question, sorry, from the beginning, um, in terms of the, the work that I do at the moment, so because we're doing work with um, defence a lot of the time at the moment, they place a very high value on evidence and scientific proof that things work. So we use live biometric data within our experiences so we can actually measure people's stress levels, measure how they're going through games, how their stress is as they're performing certain medical procedures. So we don't do anything that's attack based. We're doing all, it's all about medical treatments, but we can actually go with our biometric data. We can look at it and go, okay, when the patient's heart rate went up, you panicked and you made a mistake. Um, and then the next time through, we can then look, okay, were they less stressed the next time they went through because they knew what they were doing? Um, and we can throw different variations of the same problem at them and see how they're physiologically behaving. Because a lot of them, especially people in de defense, they'll always go, oh no, I wasn't worried and I was fine. And you won't actually get an honest response out of them. So it's good to have that extra biometric data. And we're just using smartwatches, so it's nothing fancy. Um, but that's just another form. So there's a whole bunch of different types of data that you can gather. Um, and again, some of it's conscious, some of it's stuff where you, you can do a pre and a post survey. Some of it's subconscious or physiological. 
Um, and that's a really interesting area too, is just getting into the, what sort of data can be collected and how can we use that as game creators to prove that what we're doing is valid. Um, and then also, if we can't prove that it's valid, does that mean it's not worth doing? Um, and for some stakeholders that you deal with, it will mean absolutely it's not worth doing. They want evidence, they want proof. And I think governments is probably the perfect, perfect example of that. If you can't write a 10 page report with fantastic graphs that are 60% green and, you know, um, it's probably not going to be worth it. So your hand tapping tattoo, um, you know, uh, game, it's probably really hard to prove that that has a positive impact. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just because it's an experience. It's this mm -hmm. cultural thing. Um, so that's an interesting area that's worth exploring as well is just when can you prove things work? When can't you? What does that actually mean to various stakeholders? And sometimes it means for us that um, that we realise at the start, okay, we're going to have to do this in a way that provides direct evidence. And that means potentially going down a simpler route with, with the pre and post or with a control group or with something like that that proves that it works just because we know that's what the stakeholders need uh, rather than something more creative and imaginative that we may have initially gone for, if that makes sense, and that we might intuitively believe will have a greater impact, but it's harder to measure. Yeah, um, totally agree. Like the part where you mentioned, like, I think us as creators, we know what we want to achieve with these games um, and what we want people to feel about them and from them. Um, you know, funny that you mentioned like the tattooing the hand because when, so when we first made that game and then we had one kind of like a small showcase session um, and it was in the university and there was a big event. So uh, it was kind of in conjunction with each other. And then the university basically invited like uh, one of the ministers um, to come and see all the projects who, that were being displayed. So I did our presentation um, about our tattoo game. And right after I finished, the, the minister said, um, you know, tattoos don't give you a very good future. Um, this is a very dark art. And yeah, I, I, was, I was caught so off guard. <laughs> on that um but it, it was it was more literally about trying to highlight this art uh tattooing as an art form um and and not so much telling people like oh go and get this tattoo now you know um which i think probably that's what he was thinking about <laughs> um so i think again like coming to the point where it's like we, we as creators and developers, we know what we want. Um, but then at the same time, having to balance the, stake, the stakeholders' um, expectations, the results that are going to come out of this uh, specific projects. Um, I think for our line of work, especially, is going, is, is, has never been easy. Um, and knowing that with these kind of games for social impact, where even at the front and the end, there are people who are impacted by this game, um, and the results, and the results show um, they do affect real people. And there is a real responsibility in producing these games and making sure that they impact people in in sort of like the correct way. Uh, even though sometimes there is no definite answer to this. Yeah, and it's. Uh, I think it's part of growing up as a game developer as well is realizing that you're just the sender. You can't, and you learn that you're only half of the equation. You have to allow for all the receivers as well and all the people who are going to play that game. And that's a really tricky, you know, that's what Paul was saying about the different countries interpreting things differently. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying about the minister. That's a, there's a real art to that as well. And you can never please everybody at the end of the day. And, and picking up on that localization point, right? Like I have a tattoo, a number of the people I work with at the State Department have tattoos, some visible tattoos, and you know, there's not sort of the same stigma attached with having a tattoo. Um, but 
this makes me think back. Um, so I was I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. So I lived in Morocco for two and a half years in a in a very small village in a rural village, and you know the older generation of women in that community um, would have face tattoos that were done in this sort of blue ink. And I like just had so many questions about them. And I wish there had been like a game to like teach me about this. But in reality, what it did is actually force me to like go and have conversations with these older women about like, hey, what's the story of your tattoo? What does it mean? Where did it come from? Um, and anyway, like it's just, uh, I know that the tradition of getting those tattoos is sort of fading off with the older generation. So then in that case, you know, you'll need a way to capture that sort of um, oral history or oral tradition, like hearing the stories of women about, um, you know, when and why they got these tattoos and what they meant. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think just from what we've touched on, um, like clearly we've started to talk about stakeholders and governments and people being involved in the process. Uh, so going on to that, like clearly in our line of work, it's very rarely um, just a one man show or one team show, you know, um, it often involves a lot of collaboration, a lot of teamwork in our cases, having to deal with stakeholders who might not align with our goals. Um, so how can the gaming industry work with organizations and experts outside of the industry um, to deliver these socially impactful games? Um, and how do we work around um, these stakeholder um, expectations, impressions, uh, results, um, trying to hold our, stand our ground, you know, as developers and creators? And maybe let's go to Dale first. Yeah, sure. Um... Well, I think this is a perfect example and this sort of thing's happening more and more, whereas games education in particular used to be just about the mechanics of making a game. I think people are now realising, no, games are about storytelling. Games are about your values, your ethics, stories that you want to tell um, and making, you know, as everybody in the audience here today is probably aware, just making people aware that that's what you can do and those games will have a huge impact um, the gaming industry itself, as it is at the moment, I think, as I said before, it's evolving. Um, the gaming industry in Australia is probably quite similar to Malaysia, where they almost, I'd say it's almost, especially the AAA gaming industry is almost parasitic. It just travels to the cheapest place. And as soon as the dollar value in one country goes up and it goes down in another, it's like, okay, so the next game is going to be made here. Now we're going to move here. Now we're going to move here. Um, so it's quite terrible in that way, but I'm talking about the big AAA mm -hmm. kind of games. Um, there's not much loyalty. They're, they're really just about making money. So they're quite similar to a lot of the Hollywood films in that way. Um, I think the way that we can spread that word is through, you know, organizations like Baju Baju, the, the YCLE program and Games for Change. And there's a lot of good organizations out there that are preaching the good that games can do and getting these ideas in young people's heads to begin with. Um, I had, as I said, when I used to teach game design a long time ago, it was 98% males and probably 90% of them went, were there to make shooting games. And not many of them actually went on to work in the industry. And that would have been out of say 150 students a year. A few years ago, I went up to the University of Sunshine Coast and they had a Bachelor of Serious Games. So that was a degree that was actually made to make serious games, which is quite a rare thing. They were probably 80% female, the whole course. So it was a completely different cohort. And all of the people had joined that course to make games. They were making games. One was making a game about menstruation. One was about homelessness. All these topics that were near and dear to their heart. And the stuff that was coming out of that school was phenomenal. A lot better than the stuff that my students were producing, which was just a variety of shooters. Um, so I think it's really starting at the start, educating people and getting a different, different types of people, especially, um, which involves like women is a big thing because, and it's a little bit sexist to say, but if you want people who care about people, generally that's women, you know, women are teachers, women are nurses, women look after people. 
um, that's been the traditional role in society. So having women involved in game making um, and people from all these other areas that do have problems and do have problems that they want to solve, rather than just kids who have grown up in rather privileged societies, um, you know, playing games and thinking, oh, yeah, games are cool. I want to make games when I'm older, but not really having a clue about what the job is. Um, I think that's really important is that we shift the demographic of who game makers are and who's producing games, and then we'll get some better stuff coming out. Um, and that's happening. Yeah. yeah. And and picking up on that thread, like this, like I have to come back to this all the time that like a nothing about us without us first principle. Um, you know, when I was talking about the localization of our games, you know, if we're going to try and depict people in the game who will look like players in the real world, well, people in that country or that region need to be involved in the artistic process from the beginning, right? It can't just be like, oh, I have this idea, I'll execute. And then at the very end, I'll be like, no, all right, let me just make sure I did that all right. No, it has to be like, you have to be iterating on your idea from the very beginning with the people who are your audience. Um, I was, I think Swan, you and I chatted about this before, but, um, you know, I met somebody who described working uh, she had been brought on as like a cultural consultant for a game and the game was going to depict Maori people. Okay. So, you know, Maori people, they have like these really cool tattoos that, you know, have real significance and meaning uh, to, to Maori people. And the, the studio that had created the game had not talked to a single Maori person about the game, about the tattoos until the very end when they brought in somebody and they said, well, this tattoo that you've put on a male character in the game would only make sense on a woman. Only a woman would have this particular tattoo. And the studio was sort of, you know, by that point, it was like, oh, you know, do we really want to make that change? Does this even matter? But it, it does matter. Again, nothing about us without us. Uh, a game that I think did this really well is the Never Alone series. Um, that, uh, let's see, the game is Never Alone Key Edition, K-I. And in that game, which depicts uh, indigenous people from North America, like that was a really robust consultative process from the very beginning with indigenous peoples and devs to bring a really beautiful game that tells a really powerful story about indigenous people in North America. Um, and, and then sort of to backtrack now and answer your question about, um, you know, stakeholders, you know, within government, you know, I think it, amongst maybe an older population, there's like an assumption that like, yeah, games are shooters, they all like what you are seeing, like, you know, people of an older generation have only seen like their kids play games. But I think, like, particularly with younger people at the State Department, my own age, and then, you know, a bit older, like, who have kids who are now in, in teenagers of their own. Like, uh, I was talking with a, a foreign service officer who's in the Emirates, and she saw her kid log on to Fortnite and listen to a concert in Fortnite at like, you know, three in the morning or something crazy, their time. And this foreign service officer realized this is public diplomacy. This is like a community that wants to gather for an event and you can engage people this way. So I think, uh, Dale, I know you said you're working on metaverse stuff, like the metaverse, I think is gonna be a really interesting space for gathering, for convening and having and continuing this conversation, uh, the a DEIA conversation, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility conversation. It's gonna be so important. And as people at State Department and in other governments realize that games are this real force for global social impact. And I think what you said about Fortnite, Paul, is really interesting because games reflect society as well. So, yeah. um, you can create these games and then they can be and i've had it quite a few times they're used in ways that you never imagined um and fortnite i play with my two 10 year old daughters so we'll play trios us three together but for us it's a fantastic bonding time and one of my daughters who you know i wouldn't describe as the most generous person <laughs> usually um in fortnite she's fantastic she'll run around she'll heal you she'll throw ammo at you when you need it like she's the most caring player and the, the most sharing player. Um, so to be able to see that side of her and realize, you know, through a completely different medium that this is who she is, um, is really amazing. So, 
yeah, it's all a lot of it's eye of the beholder too, and a bit of a. It's not just about changing the games because you, if you put a bunch of awful people in a really good game, they'll do awful things. They'll find a way of you know turning it into an absolute disaster. So a lot of it's just about educating the public and educating people too. So. Kind of to go off that, like I was just about to continue off that as well. Um, the the whole point of like even if you have a good game, but putting a whole lot of toxic people in it will still turn it toxic anyway. Um, yeah, I think it also kind of comes back to how how these games create this impact and then how we continue on with this impact and not leave it there as, okay, I've, I've made the game and uh, the game has X results and that's it. Um, we, especially with these kind of games and wanting to create these kind of games, I think it's very important that the involvement from the start goes through all the way to the end. And then there is some sort of a um, continuation um, post-game action um, that we can con that, that people, not just the developers, uh, but also other people can continue to evaluate um, and just continue to work on it. And then from there, hopefully we can create like a better, more caring society. Mm. And kind of like to continue, one of the points that uh, Dale mentioned the about women being, you know, more caring. Um, I did notice as well that when I when I got involved with like Games for Change uh, Asia Pacific and like the whole serious games uh, scene, I did notice that this was sort of a, it felt almost like a safer space for women to come in. Um, and that was kind of, a, a little bit of that was part of my experience as well. Um, because in this industry, I think there, there have been certain parts where I just did not feel included. Um, I don't think I was welcomed into the conversation. Uh, I don't think I was welcomed into meetings, not just because of my gender, but also because of my age. Um, but being, uh, finding like people within this scene was able to give me quite a lot of sense of community. Um, and just having people I know who I can rely on in this industry. Yeah, and that, um, for because uh, uh, Games for Change in Melbourne is part of Melbourne International Games Week. So we actually have a huge, we have a developers conference at the start of the week. And then we have PAX, which is the Penny Arcade Conference from the US also has a, a big festival in Melbourne that gets like 80, 90,000 people. It's huge. Um, the interesting thing about GCAP and PAX, the developers conference and PAX, is that when I'm, because I sit on the steering committee for that week, and they'll always talk about how they've got quotas um, for female involvement and all the, of these sorts of things, which I support. But the, the Games for Change community, as you said, Sue Ann, we don't have quotas. Um, we haven't had to because we just, we put our lineup together and then we sit down and look at it and it's like, yeah, everybody's represented. That's just the nature of what we're doing. And it's really beautiful that we don't have to do that. Um, and I think simulation is very similar because a lot of simulations used in healthcare and it's used for people who care about people. So at the simulation conference I'm involved in, it's traditionally over 50% of the attendees are female, just as a start. Like we have other issues, in, you know, in terms of culture and actually representing the diversity of our society, but the gender thing's not such an issue. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and last year, I was at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, and I'll be going again this year, uh, later this month. And from the lineup last year and looking at the lineup this year, so many different panels are about these issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the dev community. Um, you know, it's just, this is what people care about and they want to be able to see and to play as themselves or people who represent them or, you know, an entirely fictional character. Like in, in the game, you need to be able to see yourself in the game. And I mean, just to then, you know, bring it back to Cat Park and, you know, shamelessly plug our own game. I'm really excited for this feature that like, I haven't seen other games do this. You know, there's just sort of normally the characters that are available out of the box. 
But in this case, we want to have new characters that are available for players to be able to play and see themselves in the game. I think these issues are, are so important in, in the, you know, everywhere and especially in the dev community and in the games we play. All right. Um, we have hit the 10 p.m. Malaysia time mm -hmm. mark. Um, now we will move to Q&A. Um, so there is one more point that I am supposed to cover, but thankfully this is kind of related to one of the questions that have come in. Um, so, okay, somebody is asking, what should be the first steps for inexperienced or young developers uh, in making games with a cultural or social topic who maybe don't have as much access to resources or experts that can help them implement or represent the topics they're conveying properly and accurately? I'm happy to start quickly. Well, my obvious answer is going to be com conferences and festivals. Um, I think a lot of those are quite accessible, especially online conferences these days that you can go to a lot of these things for free. So if I wanted to do something, say, about um, the Australian Indigenous culture, the Aboriginals in Australia, that would probably be one of my starting points was be, would be to look at, okay, what conferences, what festivals, what gatherings are there that where people are discussing these issues so I could meet like-minded people and potentially partner with people um, and also just approaching those organizations directly I think you'd be amazed how open people are if you're going in just going look I really want to do work in this area I don't know anything about it how do I go about that um, I think a lot of them would be surprisingly forthcoming and eventually you'd find somebody who was like okay that's a wonderful idea you know, we'll help you, we'll give you whatever information you need for that. Um, and then, you know, the, the obvious traditional answer is also education. So if you're really into that area, then there's often courses or some way of learning about that area. Um, so I've given it the broad, the shallow. No, I, <laughs> Dale, I want to footstop on what you said. Um, yeah, like I think games are such an interdisciplinary tool for telling stories that you know like speaking to academics for instance like academics who might write a paper about something that you know a, only a very few people will ever read a game can help that academic reach exponentially more people because you know it's interactive it's empowering you get to play as the hero or the villain and and learn and experience uh, a culture or learn about climate change, whatever it is that you want to, the story that you want to tell in your game, talking to academics in this case, uh, I think they will be very uh, more than willing to talk to you and to help you uh, tell stories of, of whatever it is that you want to tell. The, the second point that I want to make is to start with what you know. Like if, if you know, uh, let's see, I mean, to take the, the Never Alone Key Edition, if you know Inuit culture, start with a game about Inuit culture. Uh, you know, if you're in Southeast Asia and you want to talk about tattoo traditions, start with that. Like, again, thinking, uh, you know, stealing this quote from Osama Darius, like, what are the stories that you can tell and that you want to tell? Because I think, I, I think this is like a, this is a problem that everybody has, right? That we think our stories are boring. We like, we think everybody knows what we know. And, and and so no right not everybody knows what you know not everybody has had your same lived experience so using games as a way to tell your stories i think is is really powerful and important and and i will play them <laughs> so people if you have any game prototypes send them on to paul <laughs> yeah <laughs> let him be the judge of it <laughs> Well, I don't know about the judge, but I would love to play the, your games and, and, you know, to learn. Because, I mean, uh, um, you know, I'm, Dale, I don't know if you have to do this. I have to do this all the time. Akash will, will back me up here. You know, we have to take recurring trainings all the time about cybersecurity or whatever it is. And they're so boring. <laughs> so, like, if there was a way to gamify that training, that would be great. Uh, like, what is the telling the story of cybersecurity look like but in a game um anyway that's that's yeah. my pitch <laughs> and th there is a great game called hacknet and yeah. which is about you know pretending to be a hacker and it's on steam and the creator of that's a young guy from adelaide 
and I know at one stage, so he just made that by himself because he was interested oh, in hacking, yeah. wanted to make a game about hacking, which is perhaps a little bit different than cybersecurity. Um, at one stage, he was doing a million dollar sales a year. So he set up a wow. whole business out of this little thing that he just created because that was his interest. There was no game about hacking. That's what he did. And it just, it turned into something that's, you know, it's probably still doing a few hundred thousand dollars a year sales. So mm. um, yeah, I can only dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, you know, thinking about um, the State Department, you know, like a foreign service officer, like Akash, I am not a foreign service officer, but the first job that every, well, generally every foreign service officer will have will be working in the consular section of an embassy or consulate. Uh, to help people who want to come to the United States do that. And, you know, like that process requires a lot of paperwork. And I'm always, every time I talk to a consular officer, I always ask them, well, have you played Papers, Please? Uh, and some have or some haven't. I think just to um, add my own answer to this. Um, so currently my studio does, has not continued making like a, uh, cultural game yet yet uh, but I do find that if you if you feel that you don't have much experience or much to offer yet um, I think it will do you quite a lot of good to go and work with um, these experts or communities or whoever that you can find um, and try to work with them on projects so what my studio does as well is we try to help some of the um, what do you call them? Social enterprises here, yeah. um, who may need some help in like the digitalization space. Uh, so we try to help them bring their sort of like arts and culture and information into this space. Um, and through that, I have been able to learn a lot from how these social enterprises truly, truly empower the people uh, that they are trying to help and how do they make sure that the information that gets across is correct and it is what these communities want to say about themselves to um, the world essentially. Um, so just because you cannot start with games, uh, if you really are passionate about something, I suggest that you can also try to work with them in different projects because it will help you eventually. I'm not oh, sure if everybody good. has it, but meetup.com is a really good thing here in Australia um, where you can just search for local games meetups, like we have VR meetups, AR meetups, all sorts of different meetups for whatever your interest is. There'll be some sort of gathering here in Melbourne for that. Um, and I've met a lot of people, especially through the VR meetups when VR first started. Um, that was a really good way of that community connecting. And I, I'd meet like young 16 year olds that are just like, I just want to do something. And they'd be like, well, you've got a phone, have you? And we just buy them. We just spend 30 bucks and just buy them the little headset holder. And so, okay, now you've got enough to actually go and develop. You've got a computer, you've got a phone. Get started. There's nothing holding you back. And a lot of those kids, because they were so keen back then, they were 16 year olds traveling to these meetups. They are now actually, you know, fully fledged game developers doing really well. So, that's amazing to hear. I think, you know, it's, it's also coming down to like how the, development community as much as we all see sometimes there's like the toxic parts of it I think there's a big part of the community that are genuinely helpful and um, want to help other people get in and push forward and improve instead okay uh, next question so have you worked on a social impact game that somehow did not achieve the initial goals or objectives um, if so, how did you tweak or adjust those goals, those goals along the way? And how did you balance making the game engaging, but at the same time achieve very serious objectives? I can maybe start that, Dale, unless you mind. No, uh, well, I, I shared the anecdote that with Harmony Square, we were finding this sort of uh, perverse effect where in some cases people were playing the game and then were just skeptical of everything that they saw online. And they weren't making the discernment between reliable and unreliable information. They weren't necessarily seeing trolling, sensational language, memes, whatever it is. They were just seeing everything is bad. Everybody is trying to fool me. <laughs> and so in that case, 
you know, we, we want people to be able to identify correctly what is the truth. And, and so in that case, then we added, we're adding this new feature to Harmony Square, where at the end of the game, before you finish the game and you get sort of your final score, you get like just a series of, I think it's four or six headlines. And you're asked to rate those headlines. Is this reliable or is this unreliable? And then that immediate feedback mechanism, oh, okay, yes, you correctly identified this as unreliable, or yes, you correctly identified this as unreliable, or vice versa, you incorrectly identified this, uh, is really important. So you're rewarding people with points or, or not, if they answer incorrectly, and they're getting immediate feedback. Um, that was a really important um, thing for us to add. Um yeah, we've had various, like I can tell you about a couple of flat out failures. Um, most of those were due to not following the right process. So we use, and there's a few different names for this, and we're not stuck on one particular process, but service design, human centered design, user centered design. There's different churches in what the design process is. But if you're not following some sort of process, the danger is that you're going to skip a step, you're going to jump to the end, and you're really going to miss something. Um, you know, one example of that for us was we made an augmented reality game and this was for building design students where they could walk around a local neighborhood on their phones and as they'd walk up to a certain style of house and it had all sort of old Federation style and different sort of Victorian style houses, we'd marked a few houses throughout the neighborhood, they'd walk around to these houses and they'd get asked and it was like an interactive quiz, so nothing too fancy. Um, so we just made that, it was a very low budget project. We made a version for that and a version for music venues in the city. And we trialed it the first time. And we had hordes of kids just walking across the street, looking at their phones. And it was terrible. It was the most unsafe thing you've ever seen. Um, and that was just because we didn't really think it through. We didn't do mini trials. We just sort of jumped straight to the end. And it was a huge failure. Um, a similar thing with the Red Cross here in Australia in a blood bank where we didn't engage with the right stakeholders from the start, which is always a key thing to do. You have to talk to the right people. So we designed, this is a very similar location-based app where people could walk around the blood lab and as they'd walk up, say, to a centrifuge with their tablet, it would show them, talk to them all about the centrifuge and they'd learn and they'd kind of tick off points and learn about everything in the lab. Um, we made it, we took it back to them, we delivered it. Um, we had to speak to the facility manager and he just looked at us and he was this very gruff German guy and he's just like, are you mad? Like, this is, you're introducing risk to my laboratory. You're not doing that. Like, we're not having people walking around with tablets in the lab. Like, what's going through your heads? So we'd engage with all these people, but not the right people. So process is a really big thing, I think, for me now. Like, I always know if we skip a step, it's going to come back to bite us later on. Um, and that's, yeah, learning how to do that is a skill within itself, I think, and sticking to that, is, you, you need the discipline. Okay, uh, so I think we'll do one more question. Um, what are the top three social issues that you believe are most urgent for us as game developers to raise awareness about? Guess we can, well, yeah. I, I would be totally remiss if I didn't say number one, you know, miss and disinformation, right? Uh, I have to be on brand. Um, you know, it's so important that that ability to identify reliable and unreliable information and to know the difference, to know your trusted sources, like, you know, we, we need to be able to trust what we read and see or to know that it's untrustworthy because it, it's critical to social cohesion, right? Like if we're going to continue to, to function, right, as a society, to be able to interact with people, we need to be able to have sort of the cognitive skills, that cognitive resilience to make the discernment between reliable and unreliable information and to ask critical thinking questions. Um, Second and third, I mean, in no particular order, I would say climate change. And then those those issues that we've been talking about throughout of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, yeah, for me, it's really difficult to say. And that's been one of the pleasures of doing games for Change Asia Pacific is 
every region has their own issues. So in Australia, equality is far less of an issue than it is in some other countries. Um, you know, today being the International Women's Day, that's a huge issue in some places. To me, that is the issue. Like I grew up, like Paul was saying, I spent a couple of years in Egypt when I was a kid. But like women's rights there were horrendous. Um, that was, to me, by far the biggest issue. You've got half your society who can't, has no freedom and can't contribute. Um, so I, that's where I think it's really, it's an eye of the beholder thing. I wouldn't want to rank my most important three things. Um, and then the other thing I'd say about that is, it's really hard to tell what some, the impact that some things will have on the world. You know, like I think the internet wasn't created, the internet was created for the, what was it? I think it was basically the Navy or it was created as a communication device, um, you know, by the US military. But it's been, to me, it's one of the most wonderful things that's ever happened to society and humanity. So um, I think if you do what's important to you, the impact, yeah, can be quite amazing. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm becoming more and more agnostic in terms of what my own passions are. And I'm more just passionate about um, promoting what everybody else is passionate about, if that makes sense, just because I, I really value what everybody else values which is a bit of a cop out, isn't it? But... Well, I mean, Games for Change Asia Pacific clearly has been able to give um, give all these different developers a platform uh, to share their projects and share their passions and share what they wish to tell the world. And yeah. sometimes, sometimes they didn't even have these platforms to begin with. Yeah, so perhaps that's my passion is you know allowing people to share their passions or something something a little bit more meta like that yeah. all right um i think that is the end of our session um thank you paul and dale for joining me here uh and i will pass it to back to stephanie